Welcome to CivilNet. Today we're joined by George Terterian, who came from the United States to be an election observer in the 2021 Army and SNAP parliamentary elections. So, George, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. So, first off, in layman's terms, can you explain what is an election observer? An election observer is sort of a, a referee. There's a, a nonpartisan who's there to maintain election integrity, to prevent any disenfranchisement of voters, and really to do their best to assure a free, fair, accessible, and transparent election. And how did you end up being an election observer? I, I know you've uh, been an election, an election observer prior in the United States. And how did they prepare you to uh, you know, observe an election, but in an Armenian context? Yes. In the US, I, I have been an election observer. Um, in, you know, in 2000, we had a great deal of uh, problems with our um, presidential election, and that got me interested in the process. In 2004, I was sent to New Mexico as an election observer and observed the disenfranchisement, really, of some Native American tribal voters. It made me very interested in election integrity. And as an Armenian, obviously, I'm very interested in election integrity here in Armenia. The um, way I got involved was uh, through Transparency International. I reached out um, to some friends in Armenia to find out how First of all, if they needed election observers, and if so, how I could apply to become one. There was a fairly um, lengthy process to, uh, to, to fill out the forms. They wanted to know your social media handles, even to see what kind of background you have, what kind of opinions you have, because you are supposed to be nonpartisan. We all have our beliefs, but we're supposed to set them aside at least that day to make sure everyone can vote properly. Um, I went through transparency. Under their umbrella was an organization called Aganades, which in Armenian means eyewitness. And um, I got involved through Aganades. We had training online with videos showing you all sorts of different election uh, scenarios where there might be coercion, disenfranchisement, fraud, th things of that nature. Um, there were reading materials, um, all sorts of things really to prepare you. And I also spoke to um, uh, people who had been election observers in Armenia in the past, and they gave me some really good insights. We had some training in Yerevan, locally near the Dalma Mall. Election observers were, in my group at least, mostly from Armenia. I was one of the few who had come from outside of Armenia. But there were many foreign election observers in Armenia as well. In fact, where I was stationed um, at, in the area called Masif, we had OSCE observers coming in from San Marino, from Catalonia. Um, they were not there the whole time, but they made sure to let their presence be felt and known. We also had, of course, um, multiple election observers at each polling station, um, which, you know, we had all been prepared for the different scenarios that might happen. Um, some of them had told us, you know, bring a flashlight in case the lights go out. They'd, we'd been told, don't accept food or drink from anyone just in case it might be tainted all sorts of things that you don't normally think of, but it's logical that as an election observer, you want to be clear-headed and there the whole day to ensure that everybody has access to the vote. And once you were at the polling station, what were some of the problems you encountered, some of the issues you encountered th uh, throughout the vote? Well, the first you know, problem was the heat. It was, it was unbearably hot, and it's been unbearably hot in Yerevan for the past you know, couple of weeks or so. So, you know, not everybody wanted to queue up. That was always an issue. But sometimes it's even a cultural issue that, you know, we Armenians are a bit more informal. People will just wander in. They'll see a friend. They want to start talking to them. Um, queuing up was an issue. Masking up was an issue. You know, we still had the COVID protocol, so not everybody wanted to wear a mask, but they had to, and they did, or else they were not invited in, basically. Um, some of the other issues we had, very minor to be honest with you, compared to American elections, I thought this went very well. Um, we had one incident at our location, at our polling uh, station, where somebody was wearing the t-shirt of one of the political parties. And that's, that's a no-no, that's electioneering, you can't do that. So that person was allowed to quickly vote and invited to leave immediately. But we really didn't have a lot of issues. Accessibility was not an issue. I know it's been an issue in other parts of Armenia as far as uh, wheelchair ramps and things like this, but we were at an elementary school um, at the St. Bartanans uh, 
elementary school number 106, I believe it was. In the neighborhood of Massif. In yeah. Massif, North North Massif. So they had access, they were on the first floor, the booths were properly spaced apart, the booths were against the wall so nobody could see what you were doing as far as voting. The, 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 the secrecy of the vote, I believe, was very well preserved at our district, at our polling station. And I think, in general, from the different um, oh, observers that I spoke to, in general, this was a very free, fair, somewhat orderly, not as orderly as it could have been, but definitely a, an accessible and a transparent election by any standards, and I would stand by that. And there was a lot of talk about power outages going on uh, during the election. Uh, were there issues with the power and electricity? There, we had actually uh, an outage at about 8.05. The polls were open from 8 to 8, and we were there from 6.30 in the morning until about 1.30 the next morning. But at 8 o'clock, the polls closed, the doors were locked, about 8.05, lights went out. We'd been told of, of these scenarios. I honestly don't think this one was anything nefarious because it's really very simple, Amelia, and you know that if, if it's nefarious, you're gonna see that the results are heavily in favor of one candidate at a polling station where the lights went out intentionally. The polling stations where the lights went out, all you have to do is compare them to the adjacent ones where the lights didn't go out, and if they're roughly the same uh, level of voting, and roughly the same spread of voting, then you know there wasn't a problem. But in our station, 8.05, it was still light out. You could see light out the window. It's, you know, 8.05 in the summer. So it, it got a little dimmer, but it wasn't an issue. They had prepared us, in fact. So we had our, you know, some of us had our trusty headlamps out and we put them on our foreheads and we, you know, pointed them in the direction of the um, voting box. We pointed them in the direction of the tables, kept our eyes on everything. Within about 15 minutes, the electricity went back on. So I would think in Armenia, we would call that Badahapad. I think it was just coincidental that it happened. It did happen throughout Armenia, I'm told. But again, in Armenia, sometimes the light goes out, the power goes out. If you have a thousand polling precincts and a hundred of them, or you know, 50 of them lost power, that's probably an average day. And again, all you really have to do is look at the voting tally in adjacent districts where the power didn't go out to say that there was nothing nefarious happening. We didn't allow it. We had, we had multiple um, observers in the room, the polling station, with access to pretty much anywhere we wanted to go the entire time. We took breaks, but we always had two on the ground at all times. So yeah, we lost power for about 20 minutes. Power was restored. We didn't skip a beat. Nothing bad happened. There was no funny business. Was there uh, cameras in your polling station? Was it being live streamed? There were cameras in, in every polling station that I know of, and we knew the camera was you know, pointed in a direction that would cover everything. Um, yeah, we had cameras. And we also had our own cameras, and we were videotaping, we were taking pictures. We were taking pictures of the, the ballot box that was empty, then the ballot box once it was sealed, and then the ballot box, you know, the, the ID numbers on the clips of the ballot box. We noted everything to a T. We had a very, fairly long checklist to fill out um, to make sure that every step was followed properly and we were given complete access the entire time. And comparing this to elections uh, you've observed in the United States, can you make a any comparisons? You mentioned the, I believe, Al Gore, George W. Bush yeah, election Bush of 2000. Yeah, the Bush election was a mess. and. Um, you know, we had a lot of voter disenfranchisement that happens in the United States. And, you know, since Armenia is more racially homogenous, there's not always the same motivation. Whereas in the United States, you'll have some conservative states and conservative governors who try to purge minority voters, African-American voters, Latino voters, or make them stand in very, very, very long lines. We, we did not have that in Armenia. In my polling station, a blue-class work, a blue, a blue-collar working-class neighborhood I think the longest wait was about 10 minutes to cast a vote. I'm told in Yerevan, in some of the busiest areas, maybe up to half an hour. That's nothing like in the States where sometimes intentionally people are forced to wait in line three, four, five, six, seven, eight hours to cast a vote. We did not have that problem. We do not have that problem in Armenia. But as far as the comparing and the contrasting, the issues that we're told about in Armenia is the day before the election is when the bribes are passed out. We've always been told that. And that's something that you really can't prove. Um, if somebody wants to take a bribe, they're going to. But because of the secrecy of the ballot, they can still vote the way they want. 
Um, we're told sometimes that employers might coerce their employees to show up to an event or to vote for someone in Armenia. Um, that happens sometimes in the United States as well. Um, because Armenia has the paper ballot, the biggest issue would be stuffing the ballot box. And from what I understand, not one single polling station in Armenia had that issue yesterday, or else we would have known. Um, in the U.S., there are far more problems. Sometimes technology is your friend, sometimes it's your enemy. I think when it comes to elections, it's the enemy for, for the United States because we have mostly, I wouldn't say mostly, but we have a lot of electronic ballots that can be hacked, touch screen, proprietary software, difficult to audit, no paper trail, um, and we're very decentralized. State by state, the elections are different in the U.S. In Armenia, it was all the same. There were 24 pieces of paper in front of you, one through 24, and they couldn't even stack them in advance. They had to count them out in front of you that day for security reasons. So you were given 24 pieces of paper for the, or 26, I believe, 26 pieces of paper for the political parties. You'd go into the booth, you'd pick the the number that corresponds to the one you want to vote for, you'd stick it in the envelope, seal the envelope, put the rest in a little trash bin they had right there that was constantly being emptied. You'd go over, they would, you know, stamp what you did, open the box, you'd stick it in, they'd seal the box. It was, I thought, extremely secure. In, in Armenia, you've got ID, whereas in the United States, ID is almost a poll tax issue because not every American can afford a car to have a driver's license or can afford to travel to have a passport in Armenia, you have your unsnucky, your ID. So people would show up, show their ID, get fingerprinted, be given their ballots, pull out the one that they wanted, which was a very simple process, stick it in the envelope, get rid of the rest. I thought it was, honestly, the United States could probably learn from Armenia as far as how to run this type of election because we have multiple problems. There are fewer polling stations, uh, fewer machines, uh, voter purges, all sorts of things. I thought Armenia handled this election very, very well. I can say, I can speak only for my polling station, but I can also tell you that the observers I spoke to pretty much echoed yeah. that um, there really wasn't a lot of confusion, that it was free, that it was fair, and that it was transparent. Uh, and finally, uh, as you mentioned, the CIS, the CSTO, which are both uh, Russian-led, and the OSCE and Council of Europe have all uh, given their stamp of approval, saying the election was free and fair. The OSCE and Council of Europe did bring up uh, the access accessibility of disabled people, which you also mentioned. So are you in agreement with their, their findings? And finally, are there, is there any recommendations, something even if it can be a bit flippant, something that you would advise Armenians or how elections are run in Armenia, something that could be done a little sure. better. I agree with the OSCE statement. I read it. Um, it was, I thought, a very well-run and competitive election. The polarized language is normal to Americans. I mean, we just have been through four years of Donald Trump, so we know all about polarized language and aggressive rhetoric before elections. You saw what happened on Armenian Christmas, January 6th. I mean, that's what happened in the United States. So I don't think the United States has um, a lot of room to lecture anybody about uh, elections right now. But um, I agree with the OSCE statement. I thought it was very well run. I thought it was transparent. I didn't see accessibility issues, but I'm told there were some. And that's pretty much, I think, due to some of the older infrastructure in Armenia that isn't really set up to be accessible to all yet. And I think that's something that Armenia can learn from, as far as my overall impressions, I would like to see, honestly, more female candidates, more female representation in the political parties, I think would be a good thing, um, because there's no reason why not, for one. Um, I'd like to see more accessibility, definitely. And I'd like to see more, I guess, platforms by the parties. It seems like a lot of the Armenian elections are about personalities and not platforms. I, I tend not to know who's the conservative, who's the liberal, who's the moderate, who's the socialist, who's the fascist. I tend to know the, uh, you know, who's the former weightlifter and who's the businessman and who's this and who's that. It, it seems like it's a very much a cult of personality and I would like to see more political parties, you know, draw out their platforms. But I think the U.S. could learn a lot from Armenia. Simplify your ballot, centralize your ballot, have a paper ballot. And what I loved about Armenia, what all Americans hate about elections is the election advertising. It's 24-7, it's non-stop, it's droning. But at least in Armenia, I will agree that it was also pretty much 24-7 and non-stop and droning. 
but you had 26 political parties. You had many political parties and they were all given equal access. In the United States, it's you know money talks. And in the United States, the political parties that have more money buy more time. And in that sense, they're sort of buying the election. In Armenia, it was equal time. I saw as many TV commercials for the smallest party as I did for the largest party. And that made it more free, that made it more fair. And again, because of the paper trail and the multiple observers, I think this was an election where you can be proud and say, regardless of your politics, the will of the people spoke. Well, George, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us on CivilNet.